Our reading today can be found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, verse 37, through chapter 22, verse 6. This is the Gospel of our Lord Jesus. Every day he was teaching in the temple, and at night he would go out and spend the night on the Mount of Olives, as it was called. And all the people would get up early in the morning to listen to him in the temple. Now the festival of unleavened bread, which is called the Passover, was near. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to put Jesus to death, for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was one of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers of the temple police about how he might betray him to them. They were greatly pleased and agreed to give him money. So he consented and began to look for an opportunity to betray him to them when no crowd was present. The term Satan is less a name and more of a description. In the New Testament, there is most often a singular being behind this description, but the word Satan is not this being's name. In the book of the Revelation of St. John, chapter 12, verse 9, we find the following discussion of this being. John said, The great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels, or his messengers, were thrown down with him. So this one being is known by several names, each of which describes either a title or a set of behaviors. The first appearance of this being was in the Garden of Eden. At that time, he was called Han Nakash in Hebrew. We usually translate this phrase into English as the serpent. This term can refer simply to a snake, but that is not what the prophets of Israel meant by the serpent in Genesis chapter 3. In his book, The Unseen Realm, Dr. Michael Heiser has helped us to understand who this being was originally. He wrote the following. The pivotal character of Genesis 3 is the serpent. The Hebrew word translated serpent is nachash. The word is both plain and elastic. The most straightforward meaning is the one virtually all translators and interpreters opt for, serpent. When the Hebrew root letters, nun, chet, and shin, are a noun, that's the meaning. But nun, chet, and shin are also the consonants of a verb. If we change the vowels to a verbal form, recall that Hebrew originally had no vowels, we would have nochesh, which means the diviner. Divination refers to communication with the supernatural world. A diviner in the ancient world was one who foretold omens or gave out divine information, oracles. We can see that element in the story. Eve is getting information from this being. The consonants nun, chet, shin may also form an alternative noun, nachash, which is at times used to descriptively like an adjective. Hebrew words like nechoshet, bronze or copper, are derived from this noun. Ir nakash was a place known for copper and bronze metallurgy. The option is interesting because copper and bronze are shiny when polished. In fact, the Old Testament uses nechosheth to describe divine beings in Daniel chapter 6, chapter 10, verse 6. What I'm suggesting is that since there are immediate clues in the story that the serpent is more than a mere snake, that he may be a divine adversary. The term nakash is a triple entendre. The writer wants his readers to consider all the possible nuances in their interpretive intellectual experience. All of them carry theological weight. The serpent, nakash, was an image commonly used in reference to a divine throne guardian. Given the context of Eden, that helps identify the villain as a divine being. The divine adversary dispenses divine information, using it to goad Eve. He gives her an oracle or an omen. You won't really die. God knows when you eat you will be like one of the Elohim. Lastly, a shining appearance conveys a divine nature. All the meanings telegraph something important. That's the end of the quotation. And of course, any of us who have read Genesis chapter 3 have realized that Eve was dealing with more than a common serpent. After all, how many serpents engage in philosophical or ethical debates with humans? 
Dr. Heiser has helped us to recognize that both the way the Hebrew prophets have described the Garden of Eden and the way they have described the serpent indicate that Eden and its inhabitants were not simply humans and creatures of the earth. There were spiritual beings present there as well. In fact, the Garden of Eden has been presented to us as a meeting place, not only for God and humans, but for God and all of those beings, both spiritual and physical, with whom God intended to interact. The serpent was one of those beings, and the serpent was not a material, physical creature. The serpent was a spiritual being, one who was originally welcomed in the place where God, the human beings he had created, and the spiritual beings he had created, met and interacted. In the mythological imagination of the ancient Near East, the serpent would have been associated with a throne guardian, similar to the spiritual beings called seraphim and cherubim, which the prophet Isaiah saw when he was caught up into God's council chamber in the heavens in Isaiah chapter 6. So one of the names of the being which entered into Judas in the passage we're considering today was the ancient serpent referring to his presence in the Garden of Eden and his role originally as a spiritual member of God's divine council which met there. Revelation also calls this creature the great dragon. The word translated dragon in English is the Greek word dracon. In Greek, this word was used either to describe a mythological beast, similar to what we today know as a dragon, or to describe a serpent of extraordinary size. Interestingly, in the Greek translation of the First or Old Testament, in addition to being used with reference to serpents of large size, the word dracon was also associated with the Hebrew word leviathan, translated into English as leviathan. Now, in my undergraduate and graduate studies, I was taught that the Hebrew word leviathan most likely referred to a crocodile. But it seems clear from passages like that preserved in the book of Job that the Leviathan was something more than a crocodile, especially given the fact that ancient cultures like that of Egypt both hunted and ate crocodiles. Here's the description of the Leviathan from Job chapter 41 verses 1 through 34. Can you draw out Leviathan? In the Greek translation that is dracon, dragon. Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or press down its tongue with a cord? Can you put a rope in its nose or pierce its jaw with a hook? Will it make many supplications to you? Will it speak soft words to you? Will it make a covenant with you to be taken as your servant forever? Will you play with it as, a, as with a bird? Or will you put it on a leash for your girls? Will traders bargain over it? Will they divide it up among the merchants? Can you fill its skin with harpoons or its head with fishing spears? Lay hands on it. Think of the battle you will not do it again. Any hope of capturing it will be disappointed. Were not even the gods overwhelmed at the sight of it? No one is so fierce as to dare to stir it up. Who can stand before it? Who can confront it and be safe? Under the whole heaven, who? I will not keep silence concerning its limbs or its mighty strength or its splendid frame. Who can strip off its outer garment? Who can penetrate its double coat of mail? Who can open the doors of its face? There is terror all around its teeth. Its back is made of shields and rows, shut up closely as with a seal. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. We should remember, this is God speaking to Job. They are joined to one another. They clasp each other and cannot be separated. Its sneezes flash forth light, and its eyes are like the eyelids of the dawn. From its mouth go flaming torches. Sparks of fire leap out. Out of its nostrils come smoke, as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. Its breath kindles coals, and a flame comes out of its mouth. In its neck abide strength, and terror dances before it. The folds of its flesh cling together. It is firmly cast and immovable. Its heart is as hard as stone, as hard as the lower millstone. When it raises itself up, the gods are afraid. At the crashing, they are beside themselves. Though the sword reaches it, it does not avail, nor does the spear, the dart, or the javelin. It counts iron as straw and bronze as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make it flee. Sling stones for it are turned to chaff. 
Clubs are counted as chaff. It laughs at the rattle of javelins. Its underparts are like sharp potsherds. It spreads itself like a threshing sledge on the mire. It makes the deep boil like a pot. It makes the sea like a pot of ointment. It leaves a shining wake behind it. One would think the deep to be white-haired. On earth it has no equal, a creature without fear. It surveys everything that is lofty. It is king over all that are proud. I believe that it is to this and to other descriptions of a fallen spiritual being preserved both in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28 that the book of Revelation was referring when it called the being called Satan in the passage we're considering today the great dragon. So the being who interacted with Judas was a spiritual being who had formerly been a member of God's divine counsel in Eden, the same being who had deceived Eve and convinced her to disobey God by eating of the tree of knowledge, and the same being who, after having been thrown out of Eden, was later associated with a creature called the Leviathan. The next name given to this being relates to his deception of Eve in the Garden of Eden. Revelation next calls him the Devil. Again, the devil is less a name and more of a description. The Greek word translated devil is diabolos, and it referred to a slanderer or a backbiter. In other words, this was a person who spread lies about others. In the Garden of Eden, the serpent had implied that the reason that God forbid Adam and Eve to eat from the tree of knowledge was fear. The serpent insinuated that God knew that if they ate of that tree, they would become like God knowing good and evil, and since God did not want them to become like him, God prohibited the eating from that tree. This was slander, according to the scriptures. This was not why God had prohibited the eating from that tree. And it is the origin of the title Diabolos, or in English, the devil. Jesus himself used this name to describe the being originally known as the serpent in John chapter 8, verse 44 through 45, when he said the following to those who did not believe the things he was saying, You are from your father the devil, and you choose to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks according to his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. The final name that the book of Revelation has given to the being originally called the serpent in Genesis chapter 3 is the name Satan. And like the devil, Satan is more of a description than a name. Satan is a direct transliteration of the Hebrew term Satan, which means accuser or prosecutor. In the Old or First Testament, the term Satan usually did not refer to the serpent from Genesis chapter 3. In fact, many commentators today would argue that the term never refers to the serpent in the First Testament. In Hebrew, this term was applied to anyone who stood as an accuser, that is, to anyone who brought a complaint or an accusation against another person. So it was not a term that referred to an evil person necessarily. Again, it was not a name. It was a description of a set of behaviors. So why is the serpent from Genesis chapter 3 often called Satan in the New Testament. Well, this name refers to another thing he often does. He makes accusations. He played this role in the Garden of Eden as well. The implication of the serpent's words to Eve was to accuse God of manipulating human beings and holding them back for his own benefit. This was slander, so he was a devil, but it was also an accusation, so he was also a Satan. Now, I've intended all of our discussion so far to make the following observation. We do not know the name of the spiritual being who deceived Eve in the Garden of Eden. The scriptures never give us his name. Even the common nomenclature of Lucifer is a guess based on the Latin translation of another description which may or may not be of this being in Isaiah chapter 14. Instead of a name, the scriptures give us descriptions of this being. He is called the ancient serpent, when recalling his former position as a member of God's divine counsel, who fomented a rebellion by convincing God's human children to disobey God by eating from the tree of knowledge. He is also called the great dragon, with reference to his role and form after being demoted from his original position 
and as the leader of an ongoing rebellion against God, which includes both spiritual beings and human beings. He is called the devil when he's engaged in slander, and he is called Satan when he's involved in making accusations, most often against God. So returning to our primary passage in Luke chapter 22, verse 3, in that context, the being was called Satan. Therefore, Luke was trying to tell us that he entered Judas Iscariot by means of an accusation. If he was a Satan in this context, then he was accusing someone of something. And according to his modus operandi, he was most likely making an accusation against Jesus. We're not told what the serpent said to Judas, but the text includes some tantalizing details which may allow us to speculate intelligently. First, Luke has told us already in chapter 22, verse 2, that the chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to put Jesus to death, for they were afraid of the people. It is reasonable, therefore, especially given the testimony of the other Gospels, that the disciples were aware of this murderous intent. So Judas probably realized that in turning Jesus over to them, they would seek to execute him. Second, Luke tells us that after Satan entered into Judas, he conferred with the chief priests and officers of the temple police about how he might betray him to them. It seems likely that whatever accusation Satan made against Jesus led Judas to believe it was right to turn Jesus over to the Jewish authorities when no crowd was present. Perhaps Satan accused Jesus of deceiving the disciples, and Judas wanted Jesus to face a trial. Perhaps Satan accused Jesus of needing a little push to become the Messiah, and so Judas had Jesus arrested to force his hand. Perhaps Satan accused Jesus of failing the call of God to be his Messiah out of cowardice or something like that, and so Judas intended to do God's will by handing Jesus over and forcing him to fulfill the mission God had given to him. We can only speculate. But whatever Satan said, because Luke called him Satan in this context, he was motivating Judas to act by accusation. And this begs a further question. What precisely did Luke mean when he said, Then Satan entered into Judas? The phrase translated entered into Judas in English is the following in Greek. Aesaelthen, Aesiodon. Entered into is certainly a defensible translation, but it can leave English readers with the impression that Judas was somehow possessed by Satan and therefore was no longer in control of his behavior. But that's not exactly what Luke has described to us. In a more metaphorical sense, what Luke has described is that Satan persuaded Judas to act as he acted, and given the name Satan, he did so by making one or a series of accusations against Jesus. What Luke appears to have described is an agreement of sorts. Satan's words of accusation came into Judas, Judas agreed with them, and then Judas proceeded to act based on what was said. So we ask again, how does Satan come into a person? And the answer is both simple and profound. He does so by argument, by thought. Many in our day assume that most of the thoughts that occur to us arise somehow out of our own consciousness. And we are aware, of course, that some of our thoughts come from other sources. We may be recalling a familiar song or something another person said or something that we read in a book. So we know that not all of our thoughts are our own, but we rarely assume today that any of our thoughts arise at the moment in which we are thinking them from a separate and independent spiritual being. And yet, according to the Christian scriptures, this can and does happen. Judas did not have a personal, fleshly encounter with the ancient serpent, as Jesus had earlier in the Gospel. That's not what Luke has described. Instead, Luke has told us that Satan entered into Judas. In other words, Satan entered Judas's thoughts. That is, Satan spoke to Judas. And Judas experienced Satan speaking as thoughts or ideas arising within him. It's possible that Judas thought these were his own thoughts, but Luke tells us that they were not. Judas was deceived by Satan into betraying Jesus. How? Simply by thinking and by failing to test the spirits he was hearing to see if they were from God. 
This is the reality to which the Apostle John was referring when he said the following in 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming, and now it is already in the world. What the Apostle John called spirits, we today would call thoughts or ideas. John was warning Christians of the first century that not all of their thoughts, that not all of their insights, that not all of their ideas came from God, or from a proper reading or understanding of God's word. False prophets are those who fail to test these spirits to see if they are from God. False prophets are those who uncritically trust their instincts, trust their ideas, trust their insights. For John, we must be careful with the thoughts that occur to us, because by these things people can be deceived. The spiritual beings in rebellion against God, like Satan, know this. And because they are spiritual beings, they can present their ideas to us simply by entering into us, that is, simply by making suggestions that present themselves to us as our own thoughts. For John, we must test these spirits by comparing and contrasting them with the teachings and example of Jesus. And Judas had that opportunity. We're told in Luke chapter 21, verses 37 through 38, every day he, Jesus, was teaching in the temple, and at night he would go out and spend the night on the Mount of Olives, as it was called, and all the people would get up early in the morning to listen to him in the temple. So not only had Judas been following Jesus for years by this time, but even in the days leading up to Jesus' arrest, Judas had been listening to Jesus teach all day, every day. Judas had received all he needed to test the spirits to see if they were from God. However, when Satan entered into Judas, that is, when the ancient serpent caused certain thoughts to arise in Judas' mind, as Eve before him, Judas decided that Satan's accusations were more persuasive than Jesus' teachings. In this way, Satan entered into Judas, and in response, Judas sought to find a way to betray Jesus to those who were looking for an opportunity to kill him, out of view of the crowds who were following him. The Gospel according to John would later reveal that Judas had a weakness for money, and so it may be that the possibility of profiting from Jesus' arrest may have been part of what Satan presented to Judas in his thoughts. Any who have listened to the sermon series through the Gospel of John that I preached may remember that this is my suspicion personally. However, what Luke has told us concretely is that the ancient serpent made accusations against Jesus, which presented to Judas as thoughts in his mind, and they persuaded him to betray Jesus. If we are to learn from the example of Judas, we too must realize that not all of our thoughts not all of our insights, not all of our ideas, arise either from us or from sources we can control. When God created the heavens and the earth, he created not only material creatures, but he also created spiritual beings. And just as some of God's material creations are in rebellion against his rule, so also are some of his spiritual creations. These beings speak to human beings, and when they do, we experience their words as thoughts, what the writers of the New Testament called spirits. Therefore, we must test our thoughts, our insights, and our ideas to see if they are from God. Those who fail to do this, those who trust their instincts, their insights, and their ideas, become false prophets, leading both themselves and others astray. This is what the Apostle Paul meant to convey in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, when he wrote the following, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, 
and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. May those who have ears to hear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Amen.